Enter the Bath Mayo Experience. Bath Mayo Experience. Bath Mayo Experience. Bath Mayo Experience. Experience. Welcome to the Pat Mayo Experience, presented by DraftKings 2022 Fantasy Football Running Back Rankings Part 3, The Bottom Tiers. We have went through Tier 1, Tier 2, Tier 3, and then Tier 4, Tier 5, Tier 6, Tier 7. You can check out both those shows down in the description and up on Mayo Media Network right now, completely free. The entire draft kit is down in the description as well. All the hot links, all completely free as well. So remember to smash the like and sub to Mayo Media Network. That way, you can help us out. Also... You want to make your own projections this year completely free and adapt them any way that you want and mess around with them. RunTheSims.com has got you covered. They have the stock projections in there. Then you can manipulate them any way that you like. Just put in your email and boom, the season-long projections completely free. You want to get DFS and betting? It's going to cost for the season. So use code MAYO. Get yourself 10% off. The early bird package is still going on right now. I believe it brings it down to 190 bucks for the NFL season. If you want to get in on it, I suggest you do it with code MAYO at runthesims.com. If you don't want to do it, don't do it. No big deal. All right. Jake Seeley from theathletic.com is on the line right now. Mr. At All In Kid. We've we've worked through these rankings pretty well here. Do you want me to recap them for you to see what we got? Uh, I think that would be good, especially because I don't remember where we put some of the names. <laughs> so th- this is what we got working so far. <laughs> Tier 1, McCaffrey and Jonathan Taylor. Tier 2, Henry, Najee, and Austin Eckler. Tier 3, Leonard Fournette, the fat Leonard Fournette, still up there at the moment. Delvin Cook, Joe Mixon, Saquon Barkley, and Cam Akers. Well, I might continue to drop Cam Akers down. We'll see. Tier 4, Alvin Kamara, Aaron Jones, DeAndre Swift, Javante Williams, and Nick Chubb. Tier 5, Travis Etchen, Brees Hall, Josh Jacobs, James Conner, David Montgomery. Tier 6, Antonio Gibson, AJ Hotfire Dylan, Damian Harris, and Ezekiel Elliott. And then we, we were left over with Kareem Hunt, Tony Pollard, and Clyde Edwards Alaire. And we have not yet put in, this is where I want to start today. Uh, J.K. Dobbins, Miles Sanders, Chase Edmonds, James Cook, Devin Singletary, Elijah Mitchell. We got the rest of the names to kind of sort through. So of that next tier that we're going with, this is tier what? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Tier seven. Does Dobbins go ahead of Hunt? Yes, but that's as of today. I mean, the, the news is a, it's bleak. And we, I think we talked about this on your last show, uh, or maybe I'm mixing up shows and it was mine, who knows. But the fact that we're talking about the more people start reporting the same thing, like it's beat reporters, when we're talking training camp stuff, somebody sees one thing one day and it's like, all right, let me just plug that away just in case I hear it again. When you start hearing it three, four, five times, that's where J.K. Dobbins is heading right now with his injury. And that's the concern here is the fact that early they didn't draft anybody they didn't really go after anybody in free agency so we all sat here and said this is positive news they're not concerned about Dobbins or Gus Edwards but the reports have been Gus Edwards is ahead of Dobbins recovery wise and then the more and more reports we're hearing is that because it was two ligaments and that Dobbins is potentially still behind and potentially questionable now for week one. There's still plenty of time. Dobbins fired back, as we know, and said, you know, it came on like Pat McAfee was like, but point being is we don't know. And so as of today, I think there's a fair spot. Honestly, if we knew he was ready for week one, I'd put him in the tier above this, but we don't know if he's ready for week one. And we don't know if he's going to be like uh, basically Saquon Barkley last year, where he starts off slow and we don't see the real J.K. Dobbins till late that month. So it could be, We I think we've joked about it before, Pat, could be the one that nobody wants in this backfield is going to end up being the Mike Davis people from last year are pissed off, and this is the year that he actually did what they wanted him to do last year. Yeah, if no one checked out my show with Dr. Jesse Morris, the Injury Risk Factor Ranking Show, uh, I suggest you go do that. Again, it's in that draft kit that is down in the description right now, or just find it on Mayo Media Network. No big deal there. But we talked through uh, J.K. Dobbins and Gus Edwards and their potential for re-injury, and they were both pretty high up on that list, depending on how the management goes with them. So I'm good with putting him after Kareem Hunt, but that's down in the, like the, the mid-20s right now as I look at it. That makes me feel like I'm probably way lower than market on J.K. Dobbins. Yeah, I think that, well, I think you are now kind of in range. I think initially you would have been behind, you know, mostly because I know some people, including myself, a month ago, three weeks ago, when, you know, there wasn't as prevalent as one or two people saying this, 
you're looking at the fact that I had him as a fringe RB2. Uh, now I think a lot of people, including myself, are now in this range. Like I'm thinking I take Elijah Mitchell in front of him, even with all the reports that oh, it's going to be another committee and blah, blah, blah. We'll get to Mitchell here in a second. But I would take Mitchell, uh, all the names we've said so far, I would put in front of J.K. Dobbins, including Damon Harris, even David Montgomery. Uh, and honestly, Dobbins falls into a Kenneth Walker and A.J. Dillon kind of like I know you have A.J. Dillon in front and we had that whole debate of because he could be a league winner and right now if you wanted to take Dillon in front of Dobbins I don't know if I would go that route just yet but they're essentially back to back for me so I'm okay with it yeah I'm going to continue to kind of beat the drum for A.J. Dillon a little bit I am the one spot behind Antonio Gibson one spot ahead of Damian Harris and that's in the entire tier above so now it's Hunt, Elijah Mitchell, J.K. Dobbins. Let's talk about the 49ers backfield just for a minute. Like, how do you think this ends up playing out? Because we'll, are we in a situation where not necessarily has the hate gone too far with Elijah Mitchell, but are we now at a point where where you're taking him, whatever his floor is, that's good? I think that's more what it is than anything. And I don't know if it's the hate or it's the, f- the fear of Shanahan, but the truth is when it comes to Shanahan is it's not that – he rotates running backs. It's just he makes everybody good. They're, think about uh, this time last year when everybody was going bananas for Raheem Mostert because he was healthy and he was the guy at this time. If you look across Shanahan's history, the majority, not every single situation, but the majority of situations where he switched his running back was because of injury. It wasn't a lot of, oh, I just like this guy better. There was an instance or two, but most of the time it was injuries and it was injuries in the off season. Like we just saw last year with Mostert injuries in season with Mostert and other options, but it's a lot of times injuries and he just makes everybody good. But the one thing about Shanahan is what we've learned is despite he makes everybody good, he likes his roles. He likes running backs to be, this is what you do. I don't want you to do much else. Yes, Elijah Mitchell can catch the ball, but he doesn't want him to. He's going to involve somebody else. It's very similar to like Antonio Gibson, but even lesser so with Washington as he's seen even lesser work in the passing game. So Mitchell out there, 20 plus carries in a couple games, and that's fine. The, the floor is great for Mitchell, but the ceiling is also not as great as others because he's just never going to get that much usage in the passing game. So whether it's Tyrion Davis Price or just a bunch more use chick or whoever he decides to turn to, that maybe it's Trey Sermon because uh, like this is the year that nobody wants Trey Sermon, whatever it might be. If Mitchell is healthy, I I love him as an RB too. It's just the stink of getting burned by Shanahan running backs I think is too high. How does he compare to Miles Sanders in your mind? Because I think that they're in pretty similar situations as their role as a part of this offense, and especially with both mobile quarterbacks, where you have Trey Lance. He's probably going to get one-fifth of the carries if last year was any indication on how this offense is going to run with him. It's not dissimilar to Jalen Hurts. It's I mean, they're going to have a few design runs, but both quarterbacks, when pressed, and instead of just kind of throwing the ball away, keep looking downfield, they're just going to take off running. And that's sort of the issue with Miles Sanders at the moment is Jalen Hurts is going to dig into a lot of his expected upside during rushing, even if it's not designed run-wise, that they know that they always have that out. So some of these scrambles ending don't end up becoming designed runs but they know that that is the out instead of the second read it's like first read is it there no okay you run then and we're going to be fine and I think that's going to be the same in Philly as it is in San Francisco then you have Kenneth Gainwell Boston Scott is still lingering around like I have Miles Sanders at 37 percent of the team's rushes this year that would put him around like running back 28 in terms of projections that's about where we're at right now who would you feel more confident with on your team Mitchell or Sanders Mitchell and they're similar, and you're right, the fact that the roles, but what it comes down to is you just mentioned it. We talked about it before, too, is the Eagles seem to be uh, disappointed with Miles Sanders over the last year and a half where they started pulling away the passing game from work for him. And not that he can't bounce back, and I know everybody's out there saying, there's no way he scores zero touchdowns again, just like Cole Komet, which we're not talking tight ends, but there's no way he scores zero touchdowns again. But the difference between Mitchell and Sanders is, is Boston Scott will get some carries. Kenneth Gainwell will get some carries. I actually like Kenneth Gainwell a lot as that James White type of role that you've loved for years in this backfield is I want the pass catcher, and I want the pass catcher who's also going to get a few carries and will get some work in the red zone. And maybe at the end of the season, he only gets 150 touches, but with the majority of them coming in the passing game, he's still going to get some rushing work. And the thing that really concerns me, the difference between Sanders and Elijah Mitchell, is it's not just that Sanders is likely to see a lower rushing percentage because Scott and Gainwell do more than the pieces in 49ers territory, is that 
Some of it's goal line work too. Like they trust Boston Scott at the goal. Elijah Mitchell's getting his 15 plus carries, a lot of times 20 plus carries and the goal line. Like they just use him. With Miles Sanders, it's just sure he might run the ball 15 times, but there might be some weeks where he only runs the ball 12 times, even though the backfield ran 25 to 30 times as a whole, just because they do a little bit more drive scenarios. They do a little bit more formation scenarios. Elijah Mitchell is out there. Elijah Mitchell is out there. Elijah Mitchell is out there, unless it's more passing game work. So uh, that's the difference, and that's why I have Mitchell over Sanders. Dobbins or Sanders? Mm -hmm. Dobbins, but okay. that's no. that's Dobbins if you're willing to invest the risk right now. Pollard or Sanders? Sanders. So I think that's the spot right there in between Dobbins and Pollard. That still leaves Clyde Edwards a lair at the bottom of this tier, who you like and I don't, but we did that in part, <laughs> right. we did that in part two of the show. Uh, you can go check that out. So the other names that would be considered as a part of this tier and in this mix, I think at least, where do, what do you do with Cordero Patterson? Because he could absolutely <laughs> obliterate these guys in terms of fantasy points, or it could just be a one-and-done year. Thankfully, you had him if you had him. If you didn't, like, don't go chasing those points now. Don't go chasing waterfalls, really. That's yeah. what it comes down to. It, it really comes down to, I don't think this backfield is going to be as much as his as it was last year. You saw a little bit in the second half. They don't even really know what they wanted to do with them with the passing game versus the running game. And yeah, the first half was a stark difference between the second half. But you also, they drafted Algier. And I'm not, I'm a fan of Algier. I think he's very much like a straight line. I, I, I compared him a little bit to Tevin Coleman. I'm not saying he's going to run away as in like, oh my God, get him as your RB2. But if he finishes the RB2 and nobody else in this backfield, but they also brought in Williams too. So you have Williams, Algier, Cordell Patterson, and now you have a bigger passing game with a real alpha wide receiver in Drake London. Now Drake London and Kyle Pitts. And you push down Zacchaeus and all the rest of them. It's just, I think he's going to continue to be a valuable NFL piece. It's just for fantasy purposes, we've played this game before, and I don't even mean just last year. We've played this game with players like Cordero Patterson. If you're going to top out, similar to Gainwell, at 150 touches, I think Gain I think Gainwell versus Cordero Patterson is a better argument than anything we saw last year. I think Gainwell, Patterson, James White, if he's healthy, I think that's where he falls this year, honestly. Uh, see, I'm thinking a lot better than that. Like, how much significantly better than that? That I'm not sure of, but... When it comes to Gainwell versus Patterson, I just got to feel like there's a chance that Patterson triples the reception total of Gainwell. Mm, triples? I'd say there's a chance he doubles. I wouldn't say triples. I mean, what, what what's Gainwell's? Like, if you had to put a median reception total for him, was like 25? Mm, no, I would say at least 35. What do you have last year? Gainwell wasn't used the entire year last year. Yeah, there's I just, a mix. I just, and maybe I am not thinking about this with a clear mind because I don't have all the numbers in front of me, but just thinking about it, just where Jalen Hurts. Gainwell had, Gainwell had 33 last year. He had 33? And how many like did the entire total of the Eagles' backfield have? Because it felt like they didn't throw to the running backs all that often. And that, well, I would have to check. I mean, like, I'm not, uh, what's the stats and reference people type of thing? Let's see. So, Gainwell had 50 targets, 33. Sanders had 34 and 26. Boston Scott had 16 and 13. So, 39 to 72. Okay. Yeah, Across I see, those three. I, I could see Patterson being around. I mean, maybe I underestimated on what game. All of that? That's what I'm saying. Like, Yeah, I, I think he could have all. I really do think he could have all of that. Like, if he pushed 60, 65 receptions, I wouldn't be super stunned, especially if we talk about him being in this hybrid role, more so of what we saw with he and Mike Davis at the end of last year, and whether it is Damian Williams or it's Algier or whoever it might be that is the lead runner, that's fine. But if CPAT is getting his, like, 8 to 12 carries a game, but he's also getting, like, 5 to 8 targets, gets a game it's a very valuable mm -hmm. player yeah i think what it comes down to the difference is so i have just so you know i have patterson for 67 targets 51 receptions and i have for 114 rush attempts i really i obviously think this is going to be a full-blown committee and that's why i make the comparison to james white james white and kenneth gainwell if you are right and it's even not even a full-blown committee if it's just a timeshare just two eliminate one of them williams doesn't even make the team or algiers just a rookie that was drafted late and doesn't prov provide to be anything and it's patterson and williams then yeah, sure, if you're pushing 130, 40 carries and now 75, 80 targets, then yes, he could get back into side the top even 20. Now, for my projections, even all this argument here is even with these projections, I have 114 and 67, as I mentioned, for 51 receptions. He is in 
my tier with Ken Walker, Hunt, Singletary, Pollard, and he's at 27 right behind Mitchell for me on projections alone. I just see there's a it's, it's a very large if I don't think he's going to finish running back 27. I think it's going to be that's 10 spots too low or 10 spots too high. I have the 10 spots too high. My projections spit him out as running back number 17 because we're just in disagreement about go. how this backfield is going to be used. So I have met 165 carries and 60 receptions on 78 targets. Uh, eight combined total touchdowns between rushing, five rushing, three receiving. And that gets him one spot ahead of Alvin Kamara and one spot behind Josh Jacobs. Now, I don't necessarily think he's going to reach that level. That's why I don't have him ranked as highly. Like, would I take Zeke or would I take CPAT? I'd probably take Zeke. But now I'm thinking about it. We just talked about Elijah Mitchell and Dobbins and Miles Sanders. I think I'd put Patterson at the top of that tier for me based on what his role could be in this offense and what I know his floor is going to be too. Like his floor isn't going to be, he's not going to be, unless he gets hurt, he's not going to be like running back 70 all of a sudden. So he has the potential for top 15-ish <laughs> if things break his way. If not, he's running back like 40 and he's kind of useless. That sucks. But he's in the same tier as guys who could all kind of be useless if their floor hits or if the injury stuff comes through. So I think I'd take him over Kareem Hunt right now. I have him over Kareem Hunt. I'll, I agree with you there. Do I go Patterson, Hunt, Mitchell, Dobbins, Sanders, Pollard, Clyde Edwards, Alaire, and then that leaves? Yeah, Ed so there, there's the difference. And that leaves. I mean, I have Mitchell, Edwards, Alaire, Sanders all in front of him. Okay, yeah, I, I'm not doing that. I'm not, I'm not taking these like low upside <laughs> guys. I, I just don't care to do it. Like if if you pay, play in like a 16 team league and you need a very solid flex or running back too that's consistently eight points every week, that's fine. Most people aren't playing those leagues. I'd rather have someone who is a potential league winner that maybe I have to cut after four weeks because he sucks and I have to divert my plans rather than have this like empty space, empty calories guy on my team who's too good to cut but honestly isn't good enough to help you win at the same time. Yeah, but you just – you the league winner you just meant, that's Elijah Mitchell. He was a league winner last year. If that, he keeps his role year. from last year, but, he's but, – But what I'm saying is that you can find – you know, you have to be the one who finds him, but people just picked up Elijah Mitchell in week one and went on their way. Yeah, but what my point is why is that going to change this year? Why is everybody so worried about that changing this year when last year we sat here and said, oh, it's Raheem Mostert, we have zero concerns? Why? Why is I, it different now? I think it's because of Trey Lance, to be perfectly honest with you, and what he steals away, and I don't know what his goal line work is going to be, but I just very vividly remember that game against Arizona where he had to have the spot start. He ended up with 20 carries, and he like took all the goal line rushes. Now, maybe the evolution of his game, he wasn't ready. Now they mix that up a bit, but if he's someone who's going to start calling his own number around the goal line, I mean, this is one of the reasons why James Conner became a big benefactor of Kyler Murray's injury early on last season. Like, Murray was just calling his own number from the one-yard line, two-yard line, three-yard line, and no one could put up touchdowns in that backfield. Then he got hurt, and he stopped doing it, and it just all became James Conner. I think Lance, unless he somehow develops an injury too, is just going to cut in to the overall touchdown upside that Elijah Mitchell possesses. Okay, and you made one of the better arguments there are out there because everybody else is making the argument just to be scared of Shanahan's running back. So I mean, I, I think I, that's I think that is like that's in play, but that's why he's down here already. Like that's kind of baked okay. into what we're talking about. If we're looking for tangible reasons why he may not hit his upside. I mean, you have a Debo factor and if he just, I don't think, I mean, we talked, me and Leone and I talked about Debo in the wide receiver rankings, and I just don't think he's going to carry the ball as much this year. Uh, but even if he starts getting no. his like five to seven per game, I actually think that's a negative impact for both his fantasy value, but then it starts to suck away from Elijah Mitchell's fantasy value as well. Like I would just prefer that Debo never ran the ball and he just was a receiver full time. I feel like he'd score more fantasy points that way because he's not just going to score a 35 yard touchdown every week of the season. It's just not going to happen. But if they do continue to give him carries from somewhere, that sucks a little bit away. If Lance is running more, especially inside the five-yard line, that's going to suck a little bit of away. Then I don't know mm. exactly what the upside is going to be overall. I don't think it's this like magical boom upside. Like, What is the overall upside of Elijah Mitchell? If he has the best season he can have, he's running back what? A, seven? A RB1? No. Okay. He doesn't catch the ball. Would you say seven? Yeah, I said seven. Like he's... I said N R B one, not oh, RB. Oh, not, oh. That that makes more sense. N R B one. Yeah, yeah right? so it's, it's well because what I was going to reference real quick to go back to last year for what I think, and I'm not saying this to come at you, but I think that the I agree with you on Lance. I don't agree on the Debo Samuel because even from week ten last year, 27, 27, 22, 21, 21, 27 were his carries. 
And then the the, uh, the playoff games against Green Bay was 17 for 53. And then, of course, the Rams, where they just going to get in the flow, was 11 for 20. But 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20. He was averaging 24 carries a game, even with Debo doing his thing. Oh, so I'm, that's I'm, where... I'm, I'm with you, but I'm talking about from the overall upside perspective. Debo was just scoring rushing touchdowns, thus taking those away from Elijah Mitchell. I don't think that he does that Mitchell against. scored three. Yeah, Debo had like seven. <laughs> I know, but okay, three and one, two, three, four, four, seven games. That's not good. So I'm gonna three, six. No, six games. Six games. Yeah, that's not. I'll great. take it. I'm not taking the eight rushing touchdown. I mean, drafting him at like running back thirty or whatever. Yes, I would take that from him. But if we're talking about upside, that's where I feel like Debo steals from him as well. If they're going to use Debo as a running back, and he continues just to break the like when the defense wears down, it's like, oh hey, Debo, here it is from the twenty oh so, touchdown. So you think the ceiling for in here? I think this is a good one. At, at your ceiling, you're saying is Nick Chubb last year, 1,250 yards, eight rushing touchdowns, but only buck 74 and a one receiving. Like, yeah. do you think that's a ceiling? I don't think that's a ceiling because I think that the touchdowns could break higher potentially if everything kind of goes his way. But yes, I think that sort of season is what we're thinking about from Elijah Mitchell. But that's also one of the reasons that I have Nick Chubb a bit farther down the rankings. That let's see, five, ten. He's 15 or 16. Yeah, we had that in my rankings yeah. and he got a bit of a bump up because of the situation in Cleveland right now, where it just seems like they're going to run the ball 80% of the time. <laughs> that mean, might be forced to at this point. <laughs> so I would say that's the main difference. Plus I know what Chubb's role is. It doesn't matter if the Ernest Johnson or Kareem hunt do whatever they do. Chubb is just like you pencil in Chubb. And then what happens to everyone else? We know what his role is going to be. And that's why we talked about, you know, the shenanigans, Shanahanigans or whatever the hell we're calling it. Shanahanigans. It, <laughs> it just, we don't want to have that random week where it's like, oh yeah, yeah, Trey Sermon had 18 carries today. We haven't seen that. And that's all just pure projection from people. But once you see one thing happen over the course of time with a certain coach, it just gets baked into the back of your mind. And that's why you are getting a bit of a discount here. But I think that overall upside, like if he has that Nick Chubb season, what does that make him? Like running back 13? Uh, it would be 10. That's, yeah. why, that's why I pulled up Nick, Nick Chubb to yeah. ask you about that. So, so, also, ver, so versus... Let's not, for, well, let's, like, let's not forget Jeff Wilson looks healthy, who was also in this conversation. Remember, as soon as Mostert got hurt, people were losing their effing minds for Jeff Wilson, and now he's healthy again. Yeah, I was going to say, but he got hurt. And, but he was another one where it would just be... I think there was... Was it a game against the Patriots last year or the year before, where someone else got all the carries, and it was like, oh, yeah, here comes Jeff Wilson from the one-yard line again. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah yeah that like jerome bettis type of game yeah like seven rushes from the one yard line and two touchdowns or whatever it was yeah like there's always that element at play with the niners running backs that yeah if yeah. ever if everything went right best case scenario it's still not even all that great is it how it feels like it would be valuable but we're talking about being a league winner i do feel like there's a difference between that being the guy that you pick up off the waiver wire or that's the guy that you draft in the seventh round or something okay and yet, honestly, I just mentioned at the top of this is that Shanahan has, has roles and hell, if Jeff Wilson only gets 10% of the workload, but all of a sudden his role is the goal line guy. Yeah. And now Elijah, Elijah Mitchell gets like two rushing touchdowns in the season yet. So I see your point. Chase Edmonds, how we feel? Mostert was cleared as nah. we speak today, although the show isn't coming out for like 28 hours or something like that. Hopefully nothing changes. Uh, but yeah, I'm throwing that preface out here right now in case someone ends up getting hurt. How do you see the Dolphins? Let's just talk about the Dolphins backfield in general and how you see it shaking out. Because you have Tua. Tua's not going to run a bunch, but he'll run enough. I have him at a 12% market share of the rushes. I have Mostert at 28, Chase Edmonds at 23, Sony Michelle at 20, the gas can. At the uh, eight, Salvon Ahmed at three. All these guys aren't making the team. So eventually no. that does condense somewhere. We just don't know where it's going to be. But if you had to bet on one of these running backs to lead the team in carries, who would it be? Mm, Edmonds, but by a hair. I, so my breakdown is a little bit different. I have, I have Edmonds for 30, Mostert for 26, Michelle for 17.9. White for 6.5, and then I don't have Ahmed making the team. I mean, White versus Ahmed will be the situation there. But if, yeah, I, and if it was Mostert 36 and Edmonds 20, it wouldn't shock me. Uh, Mostert, uh, he mentioned when he was signed to his team his, that he has, he has to prove himself again. You know, he's missed a lot of time. He's been hurt, but he knows the system. He knows his role in this type of backfield. This one is uh, at cost. I don't have a problem with any of them, but they all make me go, eh. Like, I, honestly, right now, Mostert and even Michelle, if Michelle was the lead, 
is but primarily the ball carrier, not so much in the passing game. It wouldn't shock me. I'm not super excited to draft Sony Michelle, but I could see Mostert and Michelle given the fact that they're relatively free almost. I think Michelle's basically free. Mostert's almost. Edmonds as an RB3, I'm okay with it. The problem, the reason I said eh when you first said Edmonds is because it comes down to this team. And the player I referenced so many times for the people that have been playing long enough is Lamar Miller. They want him to do more. They want Chase Edmonds to do more. I liked Chase Edmonds coming out of college. It's coming from somebody that's a fan of Chase Edmonds. But what has Arizona told us, and what have you seen from Chase Edmonds so far in the NFL? He's not a running back to be a bell cow. He's not somebody to get out there and get 20 touches a week. You know, 15 carries and five receptions. 20 carries if they need him that week. That's just not who he is. Can he be the lead of a timeshare? Absolutely. But as of today, right now, it's not a timeshare. It's a full-blown committee. And this is this is the Shanahan against to be. I know this isn't his team, but this is built from his coaching staff. This is the team to be concerned about of the full-blown Shanahan against. And then one week it's Edmonds, one week it's Michelle, one week it's whoever's active of the fourth running back. And that's why I'm just kind of eh on this whole backfield. And even if one of them gets cut, be it Mostert or Michelle or whoever, and it's just Edmonds back there with one of them, one of the other guys that they don't cut will somehow become a part of this as well. It'll be like Salvin Ahmed again. Of course. Oh, here, here are your nine carries a game. Great. And the other part, I mentioned Tua doesn't run a bunch, the 12% market share. Right now in the projections, I have it 2 and 2% carries for Hill and Jalen Waddle. But I could see... Th- random games where both those guys end up with like four, five, six carries as well. And again, it's almost like the San Francisco situation where once you just get too many people taking away too many carries, it's just limiting opportunities. You're right. And this is probably, if you look at their roster makeup, you're going to assume this is more passing than running anyway, even though this is coming from a Shanahan tree. Still, you don't bring in Tyreek Hill, have Jalen Waddell and Gesicki at tight end, plus signing Cedric Wilson before they even made that trade, which his value went like that. But it just feels like it's going to be a pass heavier team than what we've usually seen. And it's a limited backfield, as you just mentioned, because you're talking about this. Yeah, it's just and if you're giving any, even if you only gave three carries per game to the wide receivers combined, it's just it's tough to math out how this backfield just becomes reliant, let alone productive for fantasy purposes. So that's why it's not that I don't like Chase Edmonds, but everything we just sat here and argued about with Elijah Mitchell and talked about Cordero Patterson. I'm kind of drafting both of them and other players, even where we disagree on that, but other players like Cordero Patterson, I would draft over Edmonds because I don't see Edmonds ceiling being any higher than a low end RB two because he's not going to separate himself so much that he's getting 55, 60% of the share every single week. I want to discuss the Seattle backfield because I Mm. don't quite understand the like Kenneth Walker love. Like it's not like Rashad Penny died. He's still there. Chris Carson might get cleared with that, like, Terminator thing in his neck. I'm just going to throw him out. Let's say Chris Carson (laughs) doesn't exist, and it's just the two of them. Like, no one wants to draft Lockett or Metcalf this year, but they're actually good. And we know that Seattle's, like, not going to be able to run the ball. Like, what what is it with Rashad Penny and, and Kenneth Walker that everyone... And why one over the other? Like, I don't quite understand why people have such hot takes on this backfield. I don't really have a hot takes. I I think that I have them both uh, like draftable, but where they're going, I'm not getting either one of them. This is coming from maybe one of the top three Penny fans of all times. And because you know this, we were talking on your show last year with the rankings and everybody's like, hey, Jake, it's finally happened for Sean Penny. And I'm one of the people that seems to be, I have Kenneth Walker just outside RB2. And then I have Rashad Penny as a low end RB3 because I think they both take hits. I think it's a split backfield. You mentioned Carson. I think Walker just steps into Carson's role, but even as a lesser pass catcher, because we've seen him in college, can he improve? Sure. But how many times have we tried to paint a positive picture of somebody who really struggled? He really struggled at times in college. I know he didn't have a litany of opportunities, but there's times where he was just turned around the wrong way. Again, I hope he gets better. I hope all players get better. But as of today, he looks like a lesser version of Derrick Henry and the fact that, I mean, honestly, I would take Derrick Henry's passing game right now over Kenneth Walker's. But in the fashion, fashion that he's a run heavy, first and second down, goal line, kind of between the tackle, bruiser, like they just he's going to take those hits. And that's who he is, and he can be very good. But Rashad Penny is so explosive and so good in the passing game, like why are they going to pull touches away from him for that? And I think this is going to be this 
what everybody's looking for with other teams. Like this feels like more like the Broncos 50, 50, but not 50, 50 where they're both used and both. I think it's going to be very much a defined roles. Penny sees some carries, a lot of passing game work. Kenneth Walker sees a little more carries, but very few passing game opportunities, 50, 50 split. But as you mentioned, on one of the worst offenses in the league, one of the worst offensive lines in the league, I'm not really excited about either one of them. I have Walker over Penny, but I have them both lower than consensus. Like I'm just kind of out on both of them. So looking at the projections right now, Penny comes out as running back 37. Walker comes out as running back number 38. Now, if it stays 50, 50, 50, whatever it might be the entire season, I, I could see that playing itself out. The issue is like how many touchdowns is Seattle going to score? Mm-hmm. And that's why, I mean, even I think mine are optimistic in giving Kenneth Walker seven rushing touchdowns. I think that's optimistic, honestly. And that puts him right around 29, 30 for me and Rashad Penny's at 35. I have them, they're very close for me. Uh, but that might, I mean, you just chop off three rushing touchdowns, which wouldn't shock me. And all of a sudden he slips right behind Rashad Penny by about two or three spots. So would you rather have Chase Edmonds or those guys? Mm, I mean, this comes down to your AJ Dillon argument. I'd rather have either. I'd rather have both of them where they're going because if one of the other gets hurt or one of the other just falls to the waist, like if Penny goes back to being Penny late last year, and Kenneth Walker, Ken Walker, whatever he wants to be called, looks awful and slow out of the gates and just struggles as a rookie. Or if Penny has another injury and either one of them are now talking 70% of the work, granted, it's a piss poor backfield, but 70% of the work is still going to put you in the RB2 range. Granted, they're not going to be on one of the worst offenses and are going to finish as a top 10 running back, but they're going to finish at least 10 spots higher than where they're being drafted. Well, I'm going to go Penny Edmonds, Kenneth Walker. We'll call this tier eight of running I'm okay backs. with that. So this is after the Clyde Edwards Alaire tier. And I'll have all these rankings up on DK Nation after we finish the show. So they should be live by the time the show comes out. Uh, so you can get a running total. I'll try to add that in. But if in case I forget, DKNation.com, you search Pat Mayo rankings, boom, you'll find Pat Mayo's running back rankings. No worries on that front. Singletary. We haven't put him in anywhere. We haven't put James Cook in yet. How, I mean, I've been the most like anti-Singletary guy of all time. Just because the Bills don't run. <laughs> like, they don't run, and they're, like, it's an even worse version of what I just spoke about with the different pieces and not necessarily the running back, but the Hurt situation, the Lance situation, the Kyler Murray situation. Josh Allen's, like, the better version of all those guys. He doesn't rush the ball 18 times a game unless it's the playoffs, but loves calling his own number from the three. That's never a good sign for the running back who relies on touchdowns to score fantasy points. It isn't, but at late last year when Singletary was separated from everybody else and was seeing the 20 touches on average per game, was it six or seven straight games with a rushing touchdown for Singletary, even with Josh Allen doing his thing? That include the playoffs. But I, mean, I can just pull it up there real quick this year. Let's see. So what it was is six because it was week 15 through one, one, two, one, two, one. So rushing and actually that one game against the Jets, he had a receiving touchdown too. But for fantasy purposes, that was 16, 16, 23, 24, 23, 13 in the divisional playoff game against the Chiefs. But he was seeing that work. So what it comes down to is, do you think they treat Devin Singletary in that role again this year? I don't. I'm assuming you don't because of the James Cook. And the biggest thing you take away from this is if you take away any of those rushing touchdowns, you have to say, okay, Singletary is still going to get seven, six, five, four, six, one, a couple in there. But he's going to see that passing game work, or is that why they drafted James Cook? So I'm speculative. I think that James Cook is going to have a passing game factor. I think Singletary is hurt a little bit by that addition. They seem to want somebody not to be a bell cow. That's why they tried to make Zach Moss a thing. So if Singletary is 15 touches per game, I, I would bet against getting a touchdown rushing every single game with Josh Allen. So I'm with you. I have Singletary in the same conversation of, you know, I know you don't like Edwards Alaire as much as I do. And for everybody out there, I only have Edwards Alaire in the mid twenties, but I do have Singletary in the hunt Pollard Sanders range of in the high thirties for me, for my ranks. I'm going to bump back up Tony Pollard behind Dobbins, put him ahead of Miles Sanders just because I don't see Sanders escaping 
the any sort of like three headed, two headed backfield plus the quarterback, where that's potentially on the board for Tony Pollard should something happen to Zeke plus a standalone value. Like if they just if the rules were all similar for the rest of the season, I think that Sanders would outscore Pollard. But we have to play some expectations and project into it a little right. bit of what those rules could be. And again, when we're talking about What do about, you have Sanders for? Uh in terms of overall numbers? Okay. Yeah, I'm kinda curious how close we are on him. Let's see. Because I have Paul, Pollard and Sanders back to back. <laughs> Where is uh, Miles Sanders? 185 carries, 967 yards, five touchdowns, 38 catches, 250 yards, two touchdowns. Wow, I have him back to back, and you're much. You're actually pretty higher than I. I have Sanders at 173, 858, and only three rushing touchdowns, and then similar passing game numbers. So I, I think that skews yeah, on the you're, high. You're, I, I think that skews on the high end for Sanders, though. To be perfectly honest with you. Okay. Yeah. I th- for basically a thousand yards combined and four touchdowns total. <laughs> yeah, I think I would go Sanders over Singletary. Although you know what? Because if something happens to James Cook, then I think I would go to Singletary. Yeah, yeah, I'll go. I'll go Singletary over Sanders, but I think I'd take Pollard over both of them because I think the potential breakout from Pollard in a not necessarily full time situation, but like a seventy percent situation, if Zeke just simply ceased to exist for ten weeks or something like that. I just think that's far more valuable than Devin Singletary and what he could accomplish. So let's talk about James Cook then. Are we overstating that, oh, they draft this guy, he can catch all the balls out of the backfield? Like, it's not like Josh Allen's the check down king. <laughs> <laughs> and that's not, so I guess we, fans community, overstating for where James Cook is going. Yes, I have zero James Cook for what it is. I have him in the mid 40s because I don't even have him for 100 rushing attempts. And then it comes down to 57 targets, 41 receptions, because my Singletary share is only 46 targets and 34. So you're talking about 100 targets between the two of them, as you mentioned. Like that's uh, honestly, you could argue maybe a little bit aggressive too, because it's not like he's the checkdown king, as you said. So I think that James Cook is being inflated because of his talent and kind of the and most of his talent's passing game work too. Like if something were to happen to Singletary. I don't see them turning to James Cook. Similar to Chase Emmons, I don't see them turning to James Cook 20 times a game. He, I think there's more upside with Singletary if something happens to Cook than there is for Cook if something happens to Singletary because he's not going to get those 20 carries like Singletary was getting late last year. I think they either make try to make Zach Moss active or they bring somebody else in, and there's somebody else that's the answer because that's not who James Cook is. He's not built that way. The one thing I think we may see an uptick with James Cook from what we're – at least projecting out right now and what his role may be. I don't think that he sees the target share that many are projecting him out for, but I do think he sees more carries simply because, and we'll see what the Buffalo offense looks like without Dayball. It could be shockingly different. I doubt it, but that's at least on the table. It's an unknown. We don't know that variable right now. But if they do want to run this pass-heavy, get-up-and-go offense, you might just see James Cook luck into 12 carries a game because if you have him on the field, you're disguising your run-pass option, whereas if we get into a situation where there's a lot of Singletary on the field, they kind of know you're probably going to run. It could be. It could also depend on – there's a lot of reports – well, not a lot. There was a few reports out there that Dable was not a fan of the Singletary bell cow role, and that changed late in the year, and he let off on that a little bit as somebody else within the organization was pushing for that, whether or not that report's true. So maybe maybe Singletary keeps that role. I mean, there's a world where he keeps that, but that's why I'm saying I'm more on a Singletary for the value. The Cook, I I, I don't like – where is Cook's ADP? Is it in the 30s? Uh, it feels like every time I see him go off the board, I'm like, wow, I can't believe he's already gone off the board. He's 108 overall. Singletary is 103 overall in DraftKings best ball right now. It just Cook is a player. Singletary every single time. Cook is a player that people want to own. They want to be right about James Cook. And I, I get it. I get why you would want to be right about him. And I can see where you can make the connect the dots. You can do the it's always sunny board where you're, just, you're connecting the strings behind you, looking like a crazy person. You're like, James Cook could be running back three this year. It's like, no, he can't. That, that's not happening. <laughs> so you kind of have to pick your poison. Like he's going in that same range as both the Seattle guys. Chase Edmonds. Is he markedly better than those guys? Probably not. I don't think so. And the biggest thing, I think, you know, what name came to mind is I think everybody wants to say that, hey, look, he's uh, Austin Eckler. If something were to happen, like he's not, that though. Would, he's I not. mean, OK, I'd say that there's like a three percent chance that happens. So that could be right. I just do not think that's in a probable range of outcomes for him. No. And that's where I'm going with it. I mean, just, just, Austin Eckler is built a lot better than I. I don't, James Cook was pushing like 
190 if he was lucky when checking in for his weight. So that's a big difference between what is Austin Eckler's weight anyway? I mean, his, his legs have to be 180 by themselves. <laughs> like Austin Eckler is where? Where's his weight? I can't find it. Thanks got, a lot, Wikipedia. It's off the internet. They've taken it down. Just tweet into his. I know show. they took it. <laughs> tweet into his fantasy show, and you'll be. He'll just answer. It. Uh, oh yeah, that's true. You could just ask him. Yeah, Where's a, a, or just a, ask Liz two, to ask him, and you'll be fine. Two oh five. He's fifteen pounds heavier, and like I said, it's probably all in his legs. If you look at those two standing next to each other. Yeah, James Cook seems like someone who's going to be a very good fantasy. Like, he could be a good fantasy asset this year for what you draft him for. Flex running back sure. three fill-in guy. He could be very valuable, especially in PPR formats. Feels like James Cook is going to be really good next year or the year after. Once he kind of grow, like he's not going to be 185 forever. He's going to grow into being a man and just putting on some weight. A lot like early season Austin, early career Austin Eckler was. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a good point. Like think of him for next year. If you're playing a dynasty keeper leagues, that's the best thing to do. Or you know, hell, he might even be a second half one where people get tired after week four or five. I'm like, ah, he's doing nothing. It's all Singletary. And then they drop him. Then go pick him up. And then especially if Singletary gets hurt. That works. Houston backfield. Mac, <laughs> Pierce, Burkhead, Freeman. Feel like one of these guys is gonna be good. And like they're not being taken any Pierce is going at 126 overall. That's like the highest. I, of and the that's bunch. who I'm taking all of them. I'm taking I'm just just taking Damian Pierce time and time and time and time again. Marlon Mack, like, is okay, though. That, thank you. But that you just said that's the issue. He's okay. Yeah, but, like, we, saw, but, 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 but we saw what Houston wants to do, and that's not be good. <laughs> I just, I don't get the, the love of Marlon Mack in the fantasy community because he's good. He's arguably above average running back, but he's not great. He's He's fine, but he shows what the replaceability of the NFL running back is. As long as you're good to slightly above average, you can produce in most backfields because that's where everybody comes into draft capital and don't draft running backs, real life NFL and blah, 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 blah. It, fine. Elite running backs make a difference. He's not elite. He's not even great. I'm going to go with Damian Pierce just because he's younger without the injury history. I think his game is not too dissimilar from Morley Mack, but if I'm going to go for somebody to lead this backfield, mostly because also what is Mack's guaranteed money? Like it, Correct me if I'm wrong, but it's not much. Like, if he's not showing off well by week one, I mean, they'd just be a cut him and be like, all right, we're going to go with the other guys. So I'm going with Damian Pierce just for the fact that if you told me side by side, I think Pierce coming in fresh is slightly better than Mac. But if any of them, if any of these, including Mac himself, I'll take Mac for free too. It's not that I'm not taking Mac. They're all free. They're all fine gambles to take. You take Mac and Pierce at the end of your drafts, and maybe you hit on one of them becoming a top 30 running back but if either of them climb into like the single digit rounds i'm just going to take the opposite one so if it was pierce and he jumped into like round eight or nine I'd just be like i'll just wait till the end of the draft and take mac i'm not that excited about a houston texans running back penny edmonds walker cook gus edwards the gus bus <laughs> is damian pierce a part of that tier or is he the one after I'd put him in the one after, and I like Damian Pierce, but I'd put him in the one after. Okay, so let's fill this out. Tier 8. I just went over who is currently in there. I'm going to throw you, you say Tier 8 or Tier 9 or no. That'll be our <laughs> run-through of these like next few guys. <laughs> J.D. McKissick. Okay. 8. Okay. Pierce or McKissick? Pierce. Okay. Jamal Williams. I say 8 for him. I say remember it's eight or nine. It's, 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 oh really so you like pierce and mckissick more than you like jamal williams yes i don't i would put i i'm going to put jamal williams right after gus edwards and we kind of here's why so you mentioned it before about kind of like what's the ceiling and where i like he's basically a zero sum game for me unless deandre swift gets hurt so anybody that's pure like you're never going to be able to use jamal williams if deandre swift says and the problem here is Jamal Williams will have valuable games. Like he will finish as a top 20 some week, even with DeAndre Swift healthy, just because it kind of went his way and he got the rushing touchdown or something. And that's my problem with Jamal Williams. I hate those kind of running backs on my team because then these guys or these um, managers out there in fantasy get suckered into, oh, this might be a good week to play Jamal. You can't ever play Jamal Williams unless Swift gets hurt. And that's why I don't want him on my team. That's why I would put him in tier nine because I don't want him. 
Okay, I'm gonna lead him lead him off in tier nine then. I'll have Edwards as the back end right now of tier eight. Williams is the top of tier nine. I like him over Pierce, I like him over McKissick. Ramondre Stevenson, eight or nine. Eight, but could be nine. I have him in eight because I think that it comes down to what's the role of white slash um strong this year or white if it's white and he's not healthy and strong takes his place are they going to continue to be what we've seen from two or three years ago where they're used every single game or does stevenson's passing game improvement make him kind of like the timeshare piece every single week and then stevenson would have weekly value as a flex in a your went wide receiver and he's your flex running back or second running back and you went wide receiver super super heavy or something like that so stevenson slightly but if you wanted to put him in the same group uh there's not that big of a difference for me yeah, I'm going to throw him in the Jamal Williams tier uh, rather than the Gus. I just, okay. You know how much I love Gus Edwards. He's my guy. So oh, of course. He, so he's going to of stay course. up there. Uh, the next one is Melvin Gordon. Is he more Gus Edwards uh, or Melvin is he Go- more Jamal Williams? Mel- Melvin Gordon was one of the names that I would have put in the tier above this. So like with Clyde edwards alaire like above Rashad Penny? Yeah. I had him with Rashad Penny. All right. I'll go Penny, Melvin Gordon. I can see that. And I do Gordon, think the share is Gordon, more. Gordon's probably a safer bet for like a average type week. Yes. And as much as I do think Javante Williams sees, we talked about it when we talked Williams, sees a larger share this year. I think Gordon falls into that penny conversation into that. Not JD McKissick, Naheem Hines, where it all has to be passing game, but he's going to see Kareem Hunt. You're going to see value every single week, and then if anything were to happen to the lead option, now you have a top 15 running back. And I and I push I, I that, push I push back on that in Green Hunt because I don't believe that's true, but that's me. Right. Okay. Yeah. So that, that's what it could, and that's where I was, that's why I'm kind of like eh, on Stevenson is like because I could see Stevenson being Melvin Gordon, but I could also see him completely getting waxed out of the equation, <laughs> just being he's six touches a game. Daryl Henderson. Mm, nine. And I'm a Daryl Henderson fan. Would you go Ramondre or Daryl Henderson? Ramondre. Would you go? Because right. what we talked about, the Cam Akers. You, they, don't, you, the, don't, you don't have to expand K- on every single one of these. We got to get through players, Jake. <laughs> okay, sorry. Sorry. Yeah, yeah sorry. It's rapid fire time now. We're at the We're into tier nine, tier 10 okay. of running back. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Raheem, Raheem Moster. Nine. Nine or, nine or no? Nine. Neen. <laughs> so would you go McK- McKissick or Mostert? McKissick. Okay. Naheem Hines. Nine, but Hines and then Mostert. Okay. Ronald Jones. No. Ronald Jones. Eight. No. No is the answer. Ronald Jones stinks. All the kids. You City, argued all... against Edwards Alaire for an hour. And Ron, you're telling me there's not a world where Ronald Jones is the most valuable Chiefs running back? Sure. I, I honestly think that Jarek has a better chance of being good than Ronald Jones. You went to Jarek? I, I will go to Jarek rather than Ronald Jones, at least. <laughs> That's just overpriced nonsense. <laughs> it's not even overpriced in Tier 8. That's like cubic zirconia. You're not getting that at Jarek. <laughs> Do people still buy that? What? Jared? I don't know. Cubic zirconia? I'm sure that they zirconia? do. I, if it's not if it's not a diamond, I'm sure that's what they're going. I have earrings that are cubic zirconia because I'm not walking around with like a hundred k. Yeah, I'm not walking around with real diamond earrings. You know how often I lose my earrings, as evidenced by. Yeah, here's the trick. Wear- Found this out with the conversation. Man made, lab grown diamonds, one fourth the cost. They're diamonds. They are real, 100 percent diamonds. Everybody out there, there's a pro tip for you. That's not real. That's a, I'm real cheap. You might as well just get fake ones. No, they're one hundred percent. I actually, I'm telling you, bought something, had it appraised, appraised for twice as much as I paid for it. You're paying for rings already? I didn't say rings. I oh. said diamonds. There's yeah. I'm just blinging yourself out over there. You watch out. <laughs> Javon Walker was like a a test case for all of this. You might not want to do that. <laughs> You're gonna I'm gonna have it in my grill next show. <laughs> Uh, let's see here. Who else do we have? So we have Michael Carter, Alexander Madison, James Robinson, Marlon Mack. Jeez. Oh, Kenneth Gainwell. Damian Gainwell, Williams. did you say? Her- so so Isaiah Gainwell and I- Herbert, I have an eight. Isaiah Spiller. Yes. James Robinson, and especially with the report as of today, unless 28 hours from now it reverses course, that he's not even going to be on the pup to start. Uh, those guys, so those are all in the McKissick range for me, including Madison and Carter. All the other names you mentioned is what's in my group nine. 
Okay, I'm throwing Jarek behind Pearson ahead of McKissick because I like Jarek. And you want you know, you do. And, and you wanted to have Gainwell and Spiller up in that tier as well? Like with Naheem Hines in that? With with Carter and stuff like that. You said Carter as well, right? Yeah. What do we do with the with Michael Carter? Oh, we talked about when we talked about Hall. The, the Jets backfield. Yeah. Yeah. Like, Brees Hall. Like, would you rather have Mostert or those guys? I mean, honestly, the I see where I'm going to go. I'm going to go Carter over Monster, even though I think Monster could, because I think if Monster takes over, it's still three headed from everything we've seen, where all the reports now, this could clear up. And, you know, two weeks from now, we might get the sense that the Miami backfield is only a two horse race. And then I could lean back the other way, but we know the Jets backfield is two running backs. It's not going to be a third. I mean, yes, yeah, somebody will get two touches a game, whatever, but it's going to be that situation where what if Brees Hall falters? His, I, I love Brees Hall. Not every rookie running back, even of his talent and caliber, succeeds. We've seen plenty that don't. And all of a sudden, if Carter ends up being 60 65%, we just saw Carter last year and what he could do. And in, myself included, everybody was like, oh, my God, if this is Carter's backfield, top 15, Austin Eckler likability, blah, 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 blah. So if Brees Hall then this is why what you always argue in this range, because I'm going to go back to it, is like, that's why I wasn't a Jamal Williams because I, eh, I really 100% need an injury. Carter doesn't even need an injury. Carter just needs to look better than Brees Hall. And if it's his backfield and Brees Hall is only out there 30% of the time, Mel, Michael Carter is a top 20 running back. So I'm going to take Carter over most of those guys. I like the direct line comparison that you drew between this being a two person backfield. I think that's very important. So that throws. Because you have your backups who you still want to draft, like A.J. Dillon, Kareem Hunt. Uh, who were the other ones that we talked about? The other guy's just up in that mm. tier. Um, I'm trying to... Pollard is another one. I mean, Herbert is, but he's on a bad team. Yeah, no, but Herbert's not. I would say that Carter, Madison, Herbert, and... Do we, say, do we think that White is the primary backup to Leonard Fournette, or is that just pure speculation? Like, we know Madison is the backup to Delvin Cook. We know that Carter is the backup potentially to Breeze Hall, or is the starter, and that Herbert is the backup to David Montgomery. Like, if something were to happen mm -hmm. to those guys, these are the guys who step into that role. Do we think that's the case with White and Fournette? I got, I got to tell you, so I actually think White is a better backup, clearer than Madison. I don't know that Madison isn't going to get chipped away by Ty Chandler. Okay. That's good to know. So I'll put, I'll put Madison been at the bottom mm, of that Inconsistent. Tier. All I'm saying is that these guys have no value in fantasy unless the starter gets hurt. At least in my mind. Whereas the other guys do. Okay. They're relatively playable. Okay. That, that's why I rank them higher. But once we get to the point, like you said, like I think that Daryl Henderson's the very best case version of this right now, heading into the season, as he was last year. And I have more belief that Jamal Williams is that type of guy than anything else. Gus Edwards is kind of on a level up from that uh, going forward. Mm -hmm. But like Ramondre Stevenson, Daryl Henderson, Khalil Herbert, Carter, White, Madison. Does that make sense? It makes sense, and I have them all within, I mean, a little bit of bigger disparity, but, I mean, we're also talking in my ranks of, like, what, one, not even a point, per, not even a half a point per week difference in some of these gaps that you might have to me. So if you expanded my tier really large, yeah, like, and I know you hate Ronald Jones, but Ronald Jones, Spiller, Madison, Williams, Williams, uh, Williams, uh, are, 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 <laughs> all the Williamses, yeah, all, Daryl uh, Henderson, all, all three, of them. All three Williams. Uh, I like Is Isaiah Spiller, if Eckler gets hurt, what do you imagine that the role for Spiller is? So this is from somebody that believes in Isaiah Spiller. I know there's a lot of people that are anti-Isaiah Spiller and don't think he's anything better than what they've had. I think it's a huge improvement over anything they've had, and I think they've been trying to find a Spiller and have finally found their answer to go alongside Austin Eckler, which is why I don't think Austin Eckler necessarily sees quite as much volume as he did. And I don't think they want him to because you're going to get him killed. But all that being said is I think if something were to happen to Austin Eckler, that Spiller would step into that role. Do I think it would be 80% like a Najee Harris? No. It, I think somebody, whether it's Kelly, whoever, whoever hangs on to that role, Jackson Kelly, whoever it might be, is going to be involved. But I think you would say... If you gave me just throw out a number, like you think what the projections for Isaiah Spiller could be in that offense, if Eckler went down, I'd say fringe RB1. I think he could be in the conversation. Probably I'd say high on RB2, but like in that Aaron Jones kind of volatility, maybe some weeks in and weeks out there, but like kind of anywhere from 10 to 15 at running back. 
Okay, so I've reversed the tier here. So I go Penny, Melvin, Edmonds, Walker, Cook, Edwards. The funny thing with Kenneth Walker, and the one thing that you know people love Kenneth Walker, it's like, oh, look at the draft capital they spent on him. It's like, didn't we go through the same thing with Rashad Penny? Where if they spent this draft capital on, they're like, no, you're not playing. Sorry. <laughs> I, and especially from Pete Carroll. I was yeah. at that combine. I, I actually asked the question to him the year after. I said, after you just spent all that draft capital on Rashad Penny, like, do you want to, like, see, does he have a chance? Blah, blah, blah. And I forget my exact phrasing. But he basically gave me the Pete Carroll answer. He's like, we love all these guys, and they're all going to have roles, and they're all going to blah, blah, blah. Pete Carroll doesn't give a damn when you draft them. You could draft them one on one, and Pete Carroll will be like, I don't care. I'm going to draft who or I'm going to play who's performing. So the tier down is Ramondre, Daryl Henderson, Herbert, Michael Carter, White, Madison, Jamal Williams, Damian Pierce, Jarek, and Isaiah Spiller. And then it'll be some mix of, and this will be the final part of the rankings. Uh, we won't do a show on it because I don't think you really care about running back number 52, but like James Robinson, McKissick, Hines, Gainwell, Mossert, Mack, Elgier, Ronald Jones. I'm sure I can add some more names to that, but I'll have the full list up Deontay on DK. Foreman. Deontay, oh, really? You think so? I think he's in front of uh, anybody else in that backfield if something were to happen to Christian McCaffrey again. That's I'd, why I want to throw him out there. I, I, would, out I would think it would be like a, a split between him and Chuba. No, I don't think it's going to be as – I think it would be pretty pronounced in uh, 60, 40 at least. We saw Chuba, and we saw how much he struggled. We saw Foreman even coming off that injury. Finally, it took him that extra year, which is the speculation with a lot of these running backs is like look for them the year after. But he just looked good in all aspects of the game. All right. I'll throw him into the tier. There we go. I'm just trying to see. Is there any other name that we haven't mentioned across these three shows, these marathon shows <laughs> that you think like a great sleeper at the back end of the drafts if you're playing best ball around 20, something like that, that you can see <clears throat> making an impact this year? Mark Ingram, maybe? Damian Williams? Injury-wise, Haskins, if Henry goes down, Brian Robinson, if Antonio Gibson goes down, would be my dart throws there. I'll give you the one that I'm kind of on an island with, I think is a good three-down option and better than the person who's filled in the few times he's been banged up over the past year when Joe Mixon's finally stayed healthy. It's Captain America. We'll do it. Chris Evans, I think, is the back of something that goes down with Joe Mixon. I think he's better all around running back than P. Ryan. All right, so we'll, we'll throw Chris, Chris Evans into that mix. And there was, good God, now I'm completely spacing out his name. I actually have to go look it up. Matt, Matt Breda or Gary Brightwell behind Barkley? Somebody else is not on this team yet, but Breda. Is it just it's just Devonte Booker again? <laughs> oh God, no! Booker's in uh, Chicago, isn't he? Is he? I... Or wait, where where did Booker end up? Booker ended up somewhere. I thought he hold on. I thought he ended up back on the Giants. No, no. Oh, wait, Devonta Booker. I, I'm gonna find this out. And he is Raiders. Raiders. Oh, good. That's fun. Yeah, with their eight thousand running backs and Zamir White and. Now, in, in oh yeah, the, when when was this that he agreed to terms with the Raiders? That's what it says. But there's no like new info I mean, they, on it. Wasn't he? Wasn't yeah, he a, Booker? Wasn't he on the Raiders like three what? years ago? I don't think so. Was he? I think so. I, I recall playing him one week. It was him and like is Isaiah Washington? No, uh, DeAndre Washington. He was, yeah, 2020. It was just yeah. two years ago. Yeah, I don't think he's actually I on the Raiders. I, I, don't, I don't think that he is on a team. No, I think he signed. I'm almost positive he signed. Yeah, Let's br- see. Broncos, Raiders, Giants. And then free agent. It's not If Google doesn't know what team you play for, that's not good. <laughs> I could have sworn. Well, let's see. Free agent running back Devontae Booker is drawing interest. Yeah, he's not. No, maybe he's not. He's not. He's a free agent. He's going to come back. Yeah, he's, he's going to come back. He's going to come back and kill all those uh, Matt Breda shares. Anyway, <laughs> DKNation.com is where you can find my rankings. Jake, tell everyone what you've been doing over at TheAthletic.com now that you're going to be there for years with your new contract extension. <laughs> Years, uh, yeah, I hope this that would be nice. Uh, yes, so the last piece of the stats that matter, and more specifically, stats that don't when it comes to fantasy and NFL careers, is finishing up with quarterbacks this week. Uh, our draft kit is out just like Pat. We can you can download my projection sheet and go through the entire thing and change anything you want. Say, I'm stupid, Pat's right, and you can see like what's going to happen with my rankings as well. So you can check that out over there and then. I don't know. I need a new series starting next week. I'm going to brainstorm on something. Oh, I, don't, I know it's next week, Pat. Last year's trash. One of my favorites. Let's go back and get those players that pissed you off last year. 
Now, do you think that these are better articles or do you just want to write Twitter threads from now on? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> How did, what the hell happened the past month? What, like, where did this become a thing? Uh, in terms of like rigging the algorithm so you become discoverable to, discoverable to people who don't follow you. It's why you do it. But I felt like if I, I tried to do one. Is that why? Yeah. And sometimes I, I like a good Twitter thread. I think it can be a, a good experience. I just don't need one every single day coming from me. I feel like that would like alienate the people that follow me already. <laughs> I, I'm going to start Twitter threads on like stupid random shit that I do all the time. Oh, look at that. I just dropped it because this is so baffled by this. I'm going to just do like my TV shows, movies, T-shirts, cereal, and get everybody candy, get everybody hyped and pissed off like they do with Tim. There you go. All right. I'm Pat Mayo. You can follow me at the PME. On the Twitter machine, sub to the Mayo Media newsletter down in the description. We got tons more coming at you soon. The end of the wide receiver rankings, QBs, tight ends, top 150 plus, NFL futures, and everything of the sorts. Because football season is very quickly approaching. RunTheSims.com for free season-long projections that you can customize any way you want. You want to get to the pay site for DFS. And for the betting side, use code MAYO at RunTheSims.com. Early bird package is going on right now. Code MAYO bumps it down another 10%. You're locked in for the year, so I highly recommend that you go do that. Thank you all for watching. I'll see you next time. Experience! Experience!